Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Michelle. Um, it's been a while for many people, I think. Uh, it's one of those things that you kind of know is deep down hiding away under the layers of software that have been written, some, some by yourself and some by the people that came before you, but th down there somewhere is an, a, a, a CPU that's not running Java or C or JavaScript, it's running assembly uh, or machine code really specifically. And I'm gonna talk to you about uh, kind of learning just enough to be able to appreciate what those piles and layers of code are doing for you every day. So first of all, hello, I've already had a great intro, so there's not really much more I need to say here, um, other than this is how I started programming. Um, I think many of my kind of age um, who, who started programming in maybe the 80s, this was their first introduction to programming. It was going into a department store, um, talking your way past the clerk who was uh, in front of the array of, of computers, and then typing something like this out and hitting uh, run, typing run, and watching your name scroll up and down on the screen um, this is, as uh, Michelle alluded to, this is one of my hobbies is uh, emulating these old computer systems. So this is actually a screenshot from that. But this is how I learned to program. And I think a lot of people um, of my generation, anyway, learned to program this way. And the first thing you'll realize is that you have uh, only global variables. You have only go-to statements. So this is not really a great way of setting yourself up for success as languages have evolved away from those concepts. Uh, you'll also notice that it's a pretty primitive way of, uh, of writing code. And if you were anything like me, what you really wanted to do was write video games. And you could try and write video games using basic, which is what this language is, uh, but it would be too slow. And so you would probably start thinking, how do I make this go faster? And the only languages available to you really were writing straight out machine code in assembly. So I learned assembly first and foremost to write video games uh, in the late eighties which um, kind of helped my career in the long run. But um, I want to kind of like express to you how this path can lead you to write decent programming languages, but still be sympathetic to what's going on at the bottom of the pile. So my journey started on the BBC Micro, which is what you just saw, and um, writing video games for uh, as a teenager. Uh, I got a job in the games industry and spent nigh on a decade um, on Playstations and uh, Xboxes and Dreamcasts. I think, I don't know if it's in camera shot up here, but I've got like some very ancient old video game hardware up there. Um, some great times. And of course, back in those days, you were very, very close to the metal. That is, there wasn't very much insulating you between what you were writing as a programmer in C often uh, and what the hardware was doing. And so you were kind of abundantly aware that there were assembly instructions that were being executed. Um, and in fact, you needed to know some of those things in order to get the most out of the hardware. If you wanted more explosions on screen, then you had to write faster code. And that meant that often you were having to second guess the compiler or doing away with the compiler altogether. I then spent a few years uh, with my own company doing sort of consultancy stuff. I had a great time at Google. And then for the last 10 years or so, I've been working in finance where sort of surprisingly, I've discovered the skills I picked up as a teenage boy making video games um, are just as useful in the finance world, trying to make things go faster in terms of responding to changing market conditions. Just a slightly different budget from uh, uh, 10 pounds down the uh, the corner shop to buy games to you know thousands of dollars worth of server, or, or server hardware. So I'm gonna to explain to you the website that is my hobby that Michelle said earlier. Uh, this is hopefully gonna tie everything together and we'll get to some assembly in a second. Um, Compiler Explorer was an idea that came I came up with while I was working in the trading industry. And uh, just to sort of frame what the site is and why it might be useful, and we're going to see some examples of it as I go through explaining um, about assembly, um, this is what it looks like. Um, this will hopefully give you some idea about where we're going. So what Compiler Explorer allows you to do is type in code in a compiled language. Here I've shown C++ and I'm going to be showing sort of C and C++ examples, mainly because that's what I spend most of my time writing. Um, but similarly, you can put in Rust or Go or other compiled languages. Um, we have Python in there as well, but that's not really that compiled a language. Um, I've been asked to put in Java and some other things, which will be coming. But essentially, all compiled languages share some common behaviors. And what Compiler Explorer allows you to do is put your code on the left-hand side 
and then interactively see the results of the compiler down at the assembly level. And moreover, it color codes, and excuse my drawing here, um, it color codes the lines that the compiler has tagged um, as being these instructions correspond to this source input. So in, for example, this strange example I've got here, even without knowing anything about what it's doing, and indeed you don't need to do, I can see that there's a divide happening over here. I don't know if my mouse pointer is visible, but if it is, I'm pointing at the divide on line 10 on the left-hand side. And it corresponds to, with this light blue, this V divs with a load of junk, um, knowing nothing about assembly, I can see there's a word div in the middle of that. So it kind of makes some level of sense. And so Compiler Explorer can be a tool for helping you learn assembly by typing in familiar code in a language that you understand and seeing how it maps to the assembly that ultimately your computer is going to be running. So there's a backstory as to why I created Compiler Explorer and specifically why um, it was while I was in the finance industry. So we have a ton of code, as you can probably imagine. And from time to time, new versions of the compiler come out, new versions of the language come out. And at the time, it was my job to make sure that it was safe to start using these cool new features that were coming out in C++. This was C++ 11, so a little while ago. Um, and now, if you don't read C++, that's fine. I'm going to try and explain enough of it for it to make sense. And as I said before, most of these things make sense in other languages. Um, maybe some of the names are different. But this function here is a function that's just representative of the kind of thing that we were doing. It's a, a function which takes a variable length array, a vector of ints, and it sums them all up and returns the sum of all the elements in that array. Pretty standard stuff. And this is the old school way of writing it, where I'm essentially initializing a value to zero, and then I'm just counting over the array, starting at index zero and looping, incrementing the index until it gets to the size of that vector, that variable length array. And then for each element, I'm getting the ith element out and I'm adding it to my result. So far, so good. The new way of doing this was to use a range for. So the C++11 brought in the concept of range fors, which is a very common thing to do in other languages. C++ is always a little bit late to some the party. Uh, and this means I could write the same code by saying for int x colon v. This just means I don't need to know as a programmer exactly what the best way to iterate over a v is, whatever a v is. Just give me all the things in v and I'm going to add them all up. So that's pretty cool. That's great on me as a programmer. But if you're writing a very performance sensitive trading system, and you, you're suggesting that we blanket adopt a new way of doing something, then you better be sure that you're not about to lose your bus a bunch of money. So I wanted to check. And moreover, we'd actually been burnt by this before. Some other trading systems that we had 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 been written in Java. And what we hadn't registered at the time is that doing this kind of operation was creating more garbage than we were expecting as iterators were being created behind the scenes. And so we were a little bit wary, you know, once bitten, twice shy. So is one better than the other? Well, for me, as the programmer, the second one's much better. But if I have to explain to my boss that, it, that we're losing money, um, then it's not better. So how can we tell? Well, we're going to look at some assembly code, as you might have guessed. And we're going to walk through it. And um, I'm going to explain exactly what's going on. So hopefully you can put into practice some uh, of the uh, concepts I'm about to explain. Sorry, I'm getting it all out of order here. But a bit of a disclaimer before we move on, and that is that Reading the assembly alone, even when you understand it pretty well, can be super misleading. Like I spend quite a lot of my day staring at assembly, and even I very often, well, not even I, I very often misjudge how fast, slow, or otherwise the output is. You always need to measure as well. Now, benchmarking is itself a black art. It's very difficult to get it right. It's very hard to measure the things you, you should be measuring, and it's hard to know what the compiler is taking advantage of by knowing that you're benchmarking. Um, but it's always worth giving it a go. And almost every language has some kind of benchmarking best practices and libraries and suites and harnesses. And I encourage you to test as well. So you, you definitely need to test. What looking at the assembly can do is help you develop an intuition about what kinds of tricks the compiler can do for you. And then you can look at comparable 
um, pieces of code and make some determination about not just the is it faster, but why it might be faster to do something one way versus another. All right, and I realize I have lost the slack. Okay, there we are. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. All right. So I'm just making sure I can I can deal with any uh, live comments um, so far. Brilliant. So now to sort of the meat, the reason that you're all here, and I'm hoping that if you're watching this video, uh, if you're joining us live, then you're already interested enough in assembly that uh, you haven't been put off by everything so far. But when I speak to people who are coming into the industry, when I speak to new grads, sometimes they've had some bad experiences. And when you tell them that they're going to be looking at assembly, this is what they're expecting to see. They're expected to see some kind of dreadful, heinous language of, of evil. And maybe they've been burned by reading MIPS uh, at uh, university, or the only time that you've ever looked at assembly before is when you are like, in the debugging the most hellish bug that you've ever seen and you've had to as a last resort crack out gdb and stare at something going why am i here and you know wondering about your life choices well i'm hoping to turn that around today and i'm hoping that you can um as i do look at assembly as a thing of beauty and particularly the output from an optimizing compiler to me is like poetry bit of a tough sell i give you that it's sort of like Shakespearean poetry, you know, the stuff that you had read at school where, you know, it didn't really make all that much sense. It's super hard to write, um, to get it rhyming in the right way and to get the right number of syllables. And frankly, most of the time, if you're honest with yourself, you read it and you let it kind of wash over and you understand every third word or so, but you get the gist of it. And so you can appreciate it. And that's all I want you to, to go away with from today. Okay, the first slide with actual assembly code on it, ish. So the general form of assembly is you have an instruction, which is like the operation that's gonna take place. And then you have some number of operands, which are like the arguments to the function. If you wanna think of the instruction as a function that changes state, then you have a certain number of, of arguments to that function. They're usually very small, there are very few numbers of arguments. So commonly there's one or two or even none. So the general form, and this is, to be I'm missing out things I should have said earlier, we're going to be talking about 64-bit x86 assembly. That's because I know it best. Um, obviously, it's pretty dominant in the server space at the moment. And it, it mostly, if you're developing on PCs, then that's also what you're probably uh, writing for. Obviously, most mobile phones use the ARM instruction set, so it's very different. But although I'm going to be talking about some very specific to x86 things, there are definitely analogs and you can squint your eyes a bit and see how the two things fit together. And certainly where, <coughs> excuse me, where the two architectures are very different, I'll try and point out some sort of pointers, but this is mostly about x86. So let's take a look at some of the instructions. So that first one is an, oper uh, an instruction which takes no operands. And that is simply a return instruction. It says, I'm done doing what I'm doing. you asked me to do, go back to whoever called me. So um, you're probably familiar with the idea of functions. Uh, a call instruction is the opposite of return. That says, go away and do something else for a bit, transfers control to another part of the program. And then when that part of the program has finished doing its work, it will return back to the caller. So that's a no argument or a no operand instruction. This increment racks uh, is a single argument. And one of the things you'll notice pretty quickly on with x86 is that the first operation, sorry, the first operand is usually both a source and a destination. So most instructions have uh, a changing effect on their first parameter. So in this instance, for example, racks, increments, racks. Now racks is a register, and we'll go and talk about those in a second, but think of it as a variable. So this is just doing a racks plus plus. <coughs> Excuse me, of course, after drinking half a, a gallon of water, still not quite enough to get rid of a ticklish cough. <clears throat> Another uh, instruction would be the move instruction, which if you've done any assembly before, you've probably seen these move instructions. And they are the most confusingly named instruction of all because they move nothing. They copy. This is copying a value from one place to another. So in this instance, what we're saying is we're moving or copying the value 1, 2, 3, 4, just the literal number 1, 2, 3, 4, and putting it into whatever EDX is. So this is just like EDX equals one, two, three, four. So that's 
we've seen two different types of operand now. We've seen a register, which is the racks. EDX is also a register. And then one, two, three, four, that's a constant value. Uh, similarly, we could have a sign of ar arithmetic instruction here. And this is now also a two operand instruction. And in this case, we're using two registers. And here also we're seeing that the leftmost, the first operand is both a source and a destination. Most of the x86 instructions are of this form. So instead of having uh, like an RSI equals A plus B, I have to do a plus equals type operation. So the only thing I can do to, in this instruction here is RSI plus equals RDI. So it takes whatever RDI is and adds it to RSI, leaving the result in RSI. Some of the new funky instructions that have come out in recent times actually do have three operands, which gets over some of these restrictions. So this VP add, which if we have time at the end, I'll talk about, uh, is a three operand. This is a more traditional um, kind of looking thing where we're saying YMM1 is equal to YMM2 plus YMM0. So there are thousands, literally thousands of instructions in Intel. Intel is not known for its um, uh, small instruction set. There are many, many operations, but I'm glad to say the top 20 and not top 20 as in the most exciting or interesting, the top 20 as in I randomly sampled my computer for half an hour and saw what instructions it was running uh, comes up with these instructions. So this pretty much will get you everywhere. And so there are groups of instructions here the first group I'll draw your attention to are these kind of move operations, which again are really copy operations. So most instructions boil down to moving things around. I think you can probably understand that with shuffling data around. So MOV, MOV ZX and MOV SXD are all different ways of, of copying values. The ZX and the SX are sign extension and zero extension versions for when we're taking a small value, like a 16-bit value, and then writing it into a 64-bit destination. LEA is a funny one. It is kind of a move instruction, but it kind of isn't. We'll go into that in a bit. We already talked a little bit about how functions worked. So call goes off to a function, ret comes back from a function. Jump is just an unconditional movement to another place in the, in the code. Push and pop manage the stack. So we have a hardware stack and we can put values onto the stack and we can pull them back off of the stack. Compare and test are different ways of basically checking to see whether values are the same or different. They Compare and test very specifically, or just slightly different ways of doing the same thing. And then they set flags, and those flags are uh, essentially a, a, another register that just keeps track of the last comparison or the last arithmetic operation and allows us to jump or do other things based on whether or not certain things were true. So, for example, a comparison leaves the uh, a, a flag set that allows us to jump if equal, which is what a JE is, or a jump if not equal. So this is the kind of thing you'll see if you are doing um, loops and comparisons, and uh, you'll see that the, you'll compare like loop, pack, count, loop counters with the number of iterations and then jumping back to the beginning of the loop if you're not equal to that. And you'll notice that to a first approximation, all the jumps that happen most commonly are jump if equal and jump if not equal. Uh, there are, of course, jump if greater, jump if less than, all the other combinations and permutations of comparisons you could possibly imagine, including like overflow and stuff, but they're very rare compared to the jump if equal and jump if not equal. So all of those instructions we've done so far are kind of housekeeping instructions. They're not really doing very much. The things that are actually doing anything are arithmetic operations. So and, exclusive or, add, subtract, shift left, shift right, and shift arithmetic. So those are just shifting things around and adding and subtracting. You'll notice that in the top 20, there are no multiplies, there are no divides, there are no square roots, there are no nothing. So you, instructions for these things do exist, but most of the time you're not going to see them. It may be surprising to you that exclusive or is on this list, because I don't know about you, it's very rare that I use the little carrot thing um, to, to exclusive all things together. I mean, very occasionally if I'm writing a hash function, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll use it. But it turns out there's a trick that the compiler is using that we'll see along the way as to why exclusive or is so useful. And and is useful, again, it's kind of a way of uh, reducing the size of uh, a 64-bit integer down to 16 bit without moving using a mod for zero extension and sign, sign extending. So, uh, and shifting left and shifting right, if you remember from um, like 
a binary shift is essentially multiplying by or dividing by powers of two. So anything that needs kind of um, um, multiply by four or eight, 16, something like that, you'll see the compiler will be able to use a shift instruction instead. So that's why those are so common. So the thing sort of to take home from this is sort of mapping all of this back to my childhood 10 print math is cool is that the jump and jump of e, uh, equal jump if not equal, they're go-to instructions, right? It's go-to. I'm, I'm still doing the same thing I was doing in, in Dixon's in 84. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about what those registers are. So I kind of waved my hands and came up with these funny names for things. Uh, the registers have strange names for the first eight registers, RACs, RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP, RBP, and so on. And then they ran out of funny names um, around when they extended the register set. And so the, the second eight, uh, sorry, the eight through 15 registers of the 16 that we have available are just called R8 through R15. Those are all 64-bit wide integer registers. We also have some extended multimedia registers that are much wider and can do multiple operations at once. Those are called uh, XMM0 through XMM15. And depending on the revision of the chip that you're on, sometimes you can call those YMM or ZMM. Those get wider with each revision. So um, if you've seen things like AVX512, that's been in the news recently, <coughs> excuse me, those are using ZMM, sorry, ZMM, you can tell I've been in America too long, uh, ZMM instruction uh, register names. They're essentially the same thing. They're not different registers. They're just different widths of the same multimedia instructions. We'll talk about them a little bit, but you don't need to worry about them too much. Those are also used for floating point. So if you have a floating point operand or a floating point result, they'll go into one of those multimedia instruction, uh, multimedia registers, I'm sorry. So the really important thing to remember, and pretty much the only thing you need to remember out of this is that the way that functions cooperate with each other is that there is a kind of implied, well, there's an explicit contract called the ABI. And this tells a function where it should expect to receive its parameters, which registers it can use as scratch space and which ones it has to preserve, and which register it needs to put its result in when it's finished executing. So if you're calling a function that takes a single argument, that single argument should go in the RDI register. And if you've got two arguments, the second one goes in RSI, and then the third one in RDX, and then so on and so forth. Now, this actually varies uh, not architecture by architecture, but operating system by operating system. My experiences are all with Linux. So this is the Linux or system five, I think it's called ABI. Um, if you're on Windows, there are different registers, but the principles are the same. There is a certain set place where you should go to look for the parameter for um, a particular uh, argument if you're a function. And then when you're finished as a function, if you've got to return an integer, you should put that result in racks. And then the caller will know that that's where they should look for the result of whatever you did. So the registers in this instance are global variables, right? They're shared between functions. Imagine if you had to actually write code where in order to pass arguments to a function, you had to set some globals and then call the function. And then in order to look at the result, you have to look at another global variable. I'm sure we've all written code like that somewhere along our lives, but we all know that it's horrible. So just be thankful that your compiler is doing all of this management behind the scenes for you. So I kind of lied a little bit about registers. I said there were 64 bit and they are, but very sort of specifically in x86 land, the registers have different names. So this is the same physical register, the same A register, the accumulator register back in old, the old days. If I say racks, I'm talking about all 64 bits of that register. If I say EAX, I'm talking about the bottom 32 bits of that register. If I say AX, I mean the bottom 16 bits. And if I say AL, I just mean the bottom eight bits. There's AH as well. But So you can see that I can refer to the same register in multiple ways. And this is kind of like going back in time through the time machine or the strata of deposits of the years since 1973, whenever it was that the 80, uh, 88 came out. When it was originally just a 16-bit machine, they only had the uh, A register, and then it got extended, and then it got extended again, and then it got extended again. And so we, we've got these names that changed every time they made the, the machine go from 16-bit to 32-bit, and then 32-bit to 64-bit. They had to come up with a new name for the same register but wider and keep the old names. So you can kind of see the history here. There are some other funny things to do with zeroing and not zeroing. I don't think it's too important for you to think about, really. And mo most of the time, you'll see EAX and RACs. 
And those are the most common things you'll see. It's also worth noting that this is true for all of those registers. So RDI would also have EDX and DX as names, again, to specify different sizes, different flavors of that register, different widths of the register. All the registers have these names um, associated with them. All right. So now we know what a register is and we know what an instruction is doing. There's one other type of operand that we haven't covered yet. So the instructions can take these operands. An operand can be a register. We've seen that. An operand can be a constant. We've also seen that. And now this is very much into a kind of specific x86 thing. Uniquely, I think, to the x86, almost any operand can be a reference to memory. So on many architectures that are simpler than x86, so like ARM machines and whatever, there are explicit instructions whose only job it is, is to read and write from memory. You'll see like a load instruction and a store instruction, and those are very separate from the rest. So if you need to do ar arithmetic on anything, then you have to load the number, add to it, and then store it back out again. That's the kind of flow on a non x86 machine. On an x86 machine, we can make one of those operands of the instruction a memory reference. And a memory reference has a size. This is how big the value is that we're about to read from memory. And it has an address. And the address can be just a regular address, like an actual number, a constant address. It can be a register. That would mean that we have a register who is holding the address of the object that we're trying to read from. That's Think of it like a, a pointer in, in C terms. We can have a pointer plus a constant offset. So this would be a, a literal constant offset which is this second one down here. And then even more complicated, we can have a sized reference to a base pointer plus a constant offset plus another register multiplied by one, two, four, or eight. What this allows us to do is to mean that one of our operands can be the address, can be reading from the an, a particular element of an array held inside a structure. So if we have RDI pointing to the beginning of a structure and that 12, we know that 12 bytes into that structure, there is a variable length array of say integers, then we can read out the RSI, it's not the word, RSI, so element RSI um, in a single reference like this, where we're taking the base pointer to the structure, we're adding 12 because that's where the, 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 my mythical example where the, the, the array starts. And then we're, we're getting the RSI times four. Times four is important because each integer is of course four bytes long. And then we're reading it into EAX. And that's pretty powerful. But because like I said, you can actually put these operands anywhere. We could do something more exciting than, than a move. We could actually add. So this second example here is the equivalent to this line of C. And that's a single instruction. That's pretty impressive right there's a reason why x86 is a sit known as a CISC or complicated instruction set machine this is really complicated uh, we're doing all this operations and in a single instruction which really ought to be the most atomic and you know indivisible unit of work that the, the computer can do now i have a whole other talk about why that isn't actually true um, if you're interested in that i think there's some things on youtube about it but there is micro operations it's a lot of fun you can chase this rabbit hole down a long way but we're today we're just talking about the assembly now, it, it, it turns out that the um, this calculation that's clearly being done here, you think inside the, the CPU, something is taking RDI, adding 12, taking RSI, multiplying it by four and adding it to that to get an address to hand to like the memory system to go and read from. That bit is so useful that we can actually just do the address calculation. So this LEA instruction, which I pointed out earlier in the block of memory instructions, this LEA is a load effective address. And this looks like it's reading from memory. You'll see it's got the same looking syntax with these square brackets and a reference inside. Um, but instead of reading from this address, it just returns the actual address that was calculated. So this is like taking the address of the RSI element in the array pointed to by RDI plus 12. That turns out to be super useful, but not for the reason you might think. Okay, let's do a quick summary. 
Registers have funny names, often starting with R, so RAX, RBX, RCX, and the smaller versions are EAX, EBX, ECX. Parameters, on Linux at least, come in the first parameter in RDI, the second one in RSI, and then you look at the big list on Wikipedia to remember where the other ones are. The result for integer app, uh, operations, if you're returning an integer value, needs to go in racks. If it's a floating point, you'll put it in XMM0. Operations typically have the destination, which is itself usually a source, as the first operand. And the destined source operands may be registers or memory or indeed constants. All right, that's an awful lot of information. I'm just looking now at the time to make sure I haven't completely gone too far. But I promise you, we're going to put it into practice and hopefully it will make a lot more sense um, in context. So if you rewind the clock back, I was trying to explain where the, uh, the inspiration from Compiler Explorer came. And it was from looking at this little snippet of code. And we were saying, can we just use that? Uh, do we, sorry, the old code looks like that. And we would love to change it to this. But can we? Is that something we can do? So which is better? Well, we go to Compiler Explorer and we see. So I'm going to now throw caution to the wind and go into live demo mode where I'm taking this snippet and control clicking and hoping, yay, that it opens up and all is well. Excellent. So here we're going to see Compiler Explorer kind of live. On the left-hand side, we've got the code. And on the right-hand side, we've got the assembly, as I described earlier. Um, you'll also see that something that you couldn't see before was that as I mouse over these things, the corresponding area is also highlighting. So as well as being color coded, and I apologize if you have issues, if you're colorblind, this doesn't, it's not as easy to see. We have got some other modes that I can flip into that are more um, sensitive to those. But you can at least see that as I mouse over these areas, it, that the corresponding source or corresponding assembly is highlighted. And so we can see that 18 lines of assembly are generated uh, from this example here. And I'm using a particular set of settings, which I'm just familiar with. Um, it's not a most contemporary C++ compiler. But what we really want to do is take this code on the left-hand side, comment out that, and then replace it with for auto. That's another thing that was new that I didn't show. For the value, all the values x in v, result plus equals x. And we'll let the compiler catch up with us. And indeed, we can see that 14 lines of assembly were produced. So 18 is less than 14, right? So QED, right, we're done. This is clearly better to use the new way than it is the old way because fewer instructions were generated. Well, again, the caveat of you must always measure these things. And sometimes you'll be very, very surprised about which things are actually faster, but spoiler alert, it is actually faster with the newfangled way than it is the old fangled way, if you can fangle away. Um, anyone who's actually used C++ and Anger knows that there's also some functional um, ways of doing this where I can actually use an, a, an algorithm to accumulate, which is what this is, and I can say v.begin, v.end, zero is the starting value. And if I can actually type under the gun and get a little of this, this is like the, the very c plus y way to do things. And this code is actually identical to the range four version that I used. There are some even newer things coming down the line, but this compiler isn't new enough to show it. Um, I've also got the optimizer turned on to level two and not level three. I'll show you why, put it on level three. It goes crazy in a good way. Uh, loads and loads and loads of cool looking instructions get generated. And if we do have time, I will go into what that's doing at the end because it is super clever. But right now, what I'd like to do is walk you through the two different versions of that code to show you how to interpret the assembly code that was generated. And then moreover, that we can develop a pretty strong intuition that the new way is actually better than the old way, or at least no worse. The first two lines of that um, assembly function were identical in both cases. They were these mov rdx and mov rcx comma keyword pointer RDI and RDI plus eight. What's happening here is that we are reading the first eight bytes of whatever RDI is pointing at, and then the second eight bytes of whatever RDI is pointing at. Now, if you're unfamiliar with C++, or indeed if you haven't stopped to think about this kind of stuff before, you might be forgiven for thinking that RDI being the first op, uh, First argument, remember RDI is the where the first argument goes. RDI is this V, and therefore this should be pointing at 
a whole bunch of integers. Seems pretty reasonable, right? But that's not actually what's happening here. Uh, this ampersand here is a reference. It's essentially a pointer behind the scene. So we've got a pointer to the vector of v. But the vector of v is not the integers. The vector of v is something which looks like this. It's a small structure which itself contains the pointer to the first element, the pointer to the last element, and then some housekeeping stuff about how big the RAM chunk that this variable length array is in is. So what we're doing in these first two instructions here is reading this m start and m finished, which is the beginning and the end of the array of integers. I've got a picture. I was very pleased when I worked out how to do pictures. Um, this is what it looks like. We have RDI, which is a register. It has an address in memory. That memory at the offset zero is appointed to the beginning. That then points on to the first integer and our array references uh, each integer is four bytes. So, you know, first int, second int, third int, fourth int, blah, 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 so on until you get to the last integer. There is a pointer which points just beyond the end of the last integer in that array. So that's where we know we should stop. If we, if we start from the first int, we keep going until we hit the end. And then there's some housekeeping. Like I said, this is usually allocated in the big chunk so that if I want to put another integer in, there's no reallocation that needs to happen. It can just use this unused capacity right up until it hits the end of the storage. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're only interested in this first and second pointers here. So we're already sort of hopping twice in memory. So going back to the, the code, so we've remembered we've got end and begin in RCX and RDX. In the traditional side, and traditional is like the old loop-based version where I'm counting from zero to size. This is the code. And then the range-based thing, the four with the colon, the, the code looks smaller. This is the this is the main source of the differences to again, spoiler alert aplenty. So let's walk through what's happening on the left hand side. So the first thing we're doing here is we're subtracting, we're doing RCX minus equals RDX. That is to say that RCX will be the end minus the beginning. So if you take the end of something and subtract the beginning of it, what you've got is how big, how many bytes there are between the begin and the end. There's a bit of housekeeping just to keep registers clean. And then we shift it right by two. And so what we've calculated in here on line three is the end minus the beginning divided by four. Does this sound familiar? What might, might be happening here? Oh, if I, oh, sorry, I forgot that I've got highlights here on it um some other things we'll come back to that what we what we've done here is that we've now found the v dot size remember we're counting up to the size of the array in the uh, traditional way now if you remember back the picture of the what a vector looks like there was no explicit size stored in the vector we only had a pointer to the beginning and a pointer to the end so every time we're calling size we're asking the compiler to compute finish minus start and in C++ or C even, if you're subtracting two pointers, the result is in units of how many objects there are between the beginning and the end. So we have to divide by the size of an object, and the object in this case is an integer. So this is what we're doing over here. We're calculating what is the size. As a result of calculating the size, we get to find out whether or not it was equal to zero. That's just a side effect of the arithmetic instruction. And so on line four, we're saying if the size was zero, we're going to jump to L4. L4 is a loop, uh, sorry, is a label. It's at the bottom, and it's just a return. It just says we're done now. We're finished. There's nothing to do. Otherwise, we reconstitute the end pointer by adding the size back to it, rather curiously, and then we finally we set a result equals to zero. So earlier I said um, that the ZOR instruction was very common, surprisingly so. Here we see why. If you exclusive or something with itself, you always get zero. And so the compiler uses ZOR register with itself as a cute trick that's faster, takes up less space. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it's better, um, a, a way of setting it to zero. So you'll see ZOR EAX EAX or ZOR register register as a way of meaning register equals zero. So here we've, we've set up the, re the, the result that we're gonna be accumulating into and we've reconstituted the end pointer. Interesting. Put a pin in that. Over on the range side, what we've done is that we've set the result to zero, or what will be the result, and we've just compared the beginning and the end. 
we haven't done any calculation of the size. There's been no determination. There's been no divide, no subtract, nothing. But if the, if the beginning is equal to the end, then we go to this L4 loop. Oh, sorry, I keep saying loop. L4 label. Sorry, L is label, not loop. That means that which the, the, the check to see if there is no work to do is just a compare and a jump. And that's because the way that the range four was actually defined in the C++ standard is to essentially replace this four int x colon v with a bit of boilerplate code, which essentially looks exactly like this, the assembly code we're writing here. We get the beginning, we get the end, and then we start a for loop that starts at the begin and loops until the loop hits the end. And if they're obviously, if they're equal to each other, there's no iterations of the loop we need to stop. And you'll find that compilers typically do this. They always put a quick check at the beginning of the loop so that they can skip the loop entirely if there are no iterations that need to be done. Otherwise, it falls into a typical um, um, a sort of do-while looking thing. Now, the interesting thing is that these two approaches are about to converge. Even though the traditional side has this funny size check, it doesn't actually use the size again. This RAX register, which is another way of saying, remember, EAX, but just wider, is immediately set to zero. So we know that the result is never used again. The, um, the compiler has been able to, um, it's been, sorry, the compiler has been unable to get rid of this aspect, the size calculation, but it has been able to, to replace a loop that was counting over the ith element where i is incrementing. And instead of doing the increment of i, it's now turned it into a pointer walk such as we're doing in the range case. So the compiler has done some clever things in the traditional case, but it's not as clever as doing it in the range case. Hopefully this next step will, will make that a little clearer here. So by the time we get to this point, we have RDX pointing to the first integer. We have RCX pointing at one past the last integer. We know that RCX and RDX are not the same. So we know that there's at least one piece of work to do. And we know that EAX is, has been set to zero. And EAX, if you remember, is where the return value is going to go. So EAX is the perfect place for us to use as our temporary to accumulate into. So the first thing our loop does is it adds into that EAX. It does EAX result plus equals whatever integer RDX is pointing at. Brilliant. And we've done the memory operation and we've done the add in a single instruction. We now need to move RDX forward four bytes because we want to look at the next byte next time, the next integer next time. And then we say, is RDX equal to RCX? Have we reached the end or the, the element past the end? And if we haven't, go back to L3. And so our loop is tiny. It's just an add of EAX with a memory operand. It's an add of the loop counter, a comparison and a jump. And here is where we get the real intuition about what's happened. We know that the two versions, the one that walks the uh, traditional counting from zero up to size and getting the ith element at each time has been transformed into a pointer walk. It's byte for byte equivalent to what happened to our range for. So we now know that the inner loop where we're going to spend all of the time, presumably, is identical. That means that we can be pretty confident in saying that they are at least as good as each other. And then we can kind of look back and say, well, the setup code for the traditional version was slightly inferior to the setup code of the range for. Probably doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. The main thing that I was able to do with this information is to go to, to the rest of the team and say, it actually doesn't matter which way you phrase the code. The inner loop will look exactly the same, instruction for instruction. And we could obviously go and measure it, and we did. But this was the, the real intuition that came out of it. So yeah, we, we loop round, and of course, then we return when we've finished. And we know that the result is already in EAX. And whoever called us with that would expect to look for the accumulated result in EAX. All right, gosh, I'm looking at the time. So which approach is best? Um, I think for my money, the range for is, is considerably better. There's an argument that says the stood accumulate version is better still. And there's some ranges things coming down the pipelines that would be even nicer. But the main thing is that we've learned how to read enough assembly to be able to make judgments for this kind of highly specialist um, a, a, a situation. 
now I'd like to share some of the more interesting things that compilers can do that I've learned along the years of, of maintaining the site and dealing with uh, code snippets and trying to work out what's going on. Because if you take away nothing from this talk, uh, only one thing from this talk is that assembly isn't that scary. I hope you found that. And if you take away two things, it's that you should be able to write code for humans and your teammates and yourself tomorrow that's easy to understand, easy to maintain, easy to test, and rely heavily on the compiler almost always doing the right thing. But now you have uh, the tools uh, to, to go and verify that that is actually the case, or you can start to develop the tools that to, to, to verify that that's the case. Um, so multiplication, this is my first example. Uh, let me just check the time. Okay, right, yes, we are running over. So I, I will, um, uh, Michelle, you can stop me. I'm going to at least do one of these and then we can we can go from there just as a, a thing. Is that good? Yes, I'm looking at you. Brilliant. Golly. You see, I told you I, I normally talk fast, but I decided that I would slow down to, to, to make my point. And now, so multiplication is something we do all the time. Um, this is what it looks like if you just write a multiply, multiply with two um, operands. It makes sense, right? We know that the EDI register will have X and the ESI register will have Y. There's some shuffling around because we need to get the result into EAX and then we just use this IMAL instruction and you think, well, what more could a compiler do? And I'm going to give you the super quickest version of how multiplication works inside the chip. This is not really how it works, but just to give you an appreciation, if you've ever sat down and done long multiplication, and it's probably been a while since many of you have done, doing it in binary is even easier, but more long winded. And this is effectively what a multiply instruction has to do. So this is a four bit multiply, 13 by five. We take the left hand um, digit of the five and we multiply it, it's a one. We multiply it by 1101, we get 13, right? Because one times anything is 13, brilliant. Oh, sorry, one times anything is the anything. And we keep walking through each time, adding and doing whatever. And then we have to totalize all of those subtotals to get the final answer of 65. So for a four bit number, we had to do a whole bunch of shifts and ands and then as four adds at the end you know one or three adds this added with this added with this added with this okay to get our answer so you can imagine what a 64-bit multiply looks like something very similar to that but there are 63 ads going on in between so that gives you an idea about why an ad might be considerably slower sorry a multiply might be considerably slower than an ad uh, yes, it, it is a miracle, frankly, that the Haswell, which is a relatively old architecture now, can do a 32-bit multiply in four cycles. It's amazing what they can do. Divides are even worse, if you remember how bad it is to do divides in on longhand. The, the poor poor um, CPU has to do that too. So the compiler is very good at avoiding these things. And so to do a turbo version of this, um, if I multiply by two, you'll notice there's no multiply on the right hand side. If the compiler can intuit or infer or is just told that the thing it's multiplying by is a constant, then it will go out of its way to reduce the number of mul instructions. Here, it's using an LEA, which if you remember is an addressing instruction. But the cool thing about LEA is, is it's essentially just an add with a few benefits. These values here, RDI, don't have to be memory locations because we're never going to read from them. Although the instruction was designed to take addresses of things, it's just an add-in. So RDI plus RDI is me saying it's the base pointer of RDI plus, oh, the offset of RDI. And I want to get the address of that, please. It's not an address, but it's an add. So I get an add of myself, which gives me two times what I, what I came in with. And the result goes into EAX, which is exactly where it needs to be. Hooray. And if I play around with powers of two, you can see it's starting to use the, the thing which allows it to use the multiply by one, two, four, or eight, which is clever. So it's able to, to build um, multiplies by quite complicated things. So multiply by nine, for example, is, is RDI plus RDI times eight. Hooray, that's, you know, one plus myself, X plus X times eight is nine X. Um, but it starts to break down a little bit. If I use 16, we see it starts to have to use shift instructions because we can't multiply by 16 We're using LEAs. And if I do something as complicated as 65599, it gives up completely and just says, okay, I'm all. I'm going to just use a multiple there. Ah, go back, go back. Um, however, you can try and trick it and say, well, I know how to build a multiply myself using shifts and adds. Um, if you do this kind of thing, first of all, don't. 
Um, this is the kind of thing you'll find in the Doom source code, not in your everyday uh, um, work. But luckily, the compiler will save you from yourself because even though I wrote this junk on the left-hand side, the compiler still knows that what I'm really doing is multiplying by 65599 and that it's faster to use the multiply instruction than it is to do all these shifts and adds. So I was wrong. There was a time if I wind back the uh, the targeting here, if I tell it to target like a 486, then it is actually faster to do the shifts and adds, but it tells, turns out that the compiler is still better than me at writing the shifts and adds. So I should just write times 65599 and be done with it. So compilers can do great things with multiplication. They can do amazing things if you ever need to know how many set bits there are in um, a number, which is something that is actually useful to do. I'll go straight to the end on this one, but um, essentially, uh, modern compilers, this is not a modern compiler, a modern compiler can take this entire thing, which is counting the number of bits that are set in the unsigned integer A, and if I actually make it a modern compiler and not the ancient compiler it's on, there is a, an x86 instruction whose only job it is is to count the number of set bits, because in some cases that's really, really important to be fast, and it's super easy to do in hardware. This is what you do. So just think what's going on here. I've written an expressive, relatively expressive piece of code here, which I don't have time to go over. And the, the compiler has been able to pattern match that whole thing against an instruction which just does that. The loop is gone, the counters have gone, the internal registers have gone, it's just done a pop count. That's just an amazing thing to have happen. Uh, some clever things happen with multiple ifs. If you've got cascading ifs, the compiler can turn it into a one bit lookup table, one bit per entry lookup table, which is super clever. I would have never thought of doing this. And the fact that the compiler has got my back and will do this for me and I don't have to think about it means that I can write expressive code and rely on the compiler. Um, and I haven't got time to go through those things. Um, the thing I hinted at at the beginning, I'm really not going to have time to go through in any depth at the end here. Perhaps if there's time for questions at the end and, or if people have got further questions, um, we can go into it. But effectively, if I allow the compiler to run at the full pelt that it's, it really wants to run at, it can turn that sum that I started with into the most incredible thing, which is summing up eight values per iteration of the loop. And it takes one and a half clock cycles for each iteration. And I have a cool diagram which shows how that all fits together. But it's essentially rewritten my code to be parallel, um, not thread parallel, but CPU, single thread, multi-way, SIMD parallel. And it's just amazing that it can do these kinds of things. So sorry for taking too long on the, the assembly bit. I actually cut out some other bits of here as well. But um, as you can tell, this really gets me excited. The real thing I want to go away is that your compiler is super, super smart. You should trust it. Write code for yourself. Write it to be testable. Write it to be maintainable. Write it to be understandable by your teammates, by you know future you. Um, let the compiler write those go-tos and those globals for you. Don't dally in that world. Um, trust it, but learn how to verify it. And using tools like Compiler Explorer, there are other things like it that you can go and look at. Um, that's that's all I've got for you, and I think that's probably about uh, about time. So th thank you all for having me.